So we are going to get started, and I want to welcome everybody to our webinar today. My name is Judy Browse, and I'm the Executive Director of NAAE, and we are super excited to have you all here for today's webinar. It's such a great topic, and we have such a great lineup of speakers, so thank you all. And as you probably know, today's webinar is all about birds, and we have more people signed up for this webinar than any other webinar we've had all year long. So congrats to all our amazing speakers. And I also want to thank all our partners for making this webinar possible, including the American Bird Conservancy, or ABC, as well as Project Learning Tree and the Sustainable Forestry Initiative. Thanks to all of you. And we'll have a couple of other thank yous in a minute. But I really um, love the fact that this is all about birds and there's so much interest because using birds to connect people to nature is so important and to think about biodiversity and inclusivity. And you'll get a chance to not only learn more about birds and kind of how they relate to all of us, but also a chance to um, learn about some hands-on resources that all of you can use. And as someone who was a TA in ornithology and who worked at Audubon for many years, I have a special place in my heart for birds. And they are there's just something super special about birds and the ability to connect to people of all ages in so many ways. And we're gonna have a chance to hear from so many wonderful speakers today to help us learn more. We have this amazing lineup and you'll get a chance to meet all of them in a very short time, wonderful educators and writers and thinkers. And we'll hear from Kathy Abuso and Mike Parr at the end. So we're so happy about this lineup. And for those of you who are new to our webinars, we are trying to bring new ideas and understanding and thinking to our field and to push us all forward and think about things in a different way. This is also part of our EE Inspire series, which is sparking innovation in environmental education. And we want to thank our partners at the US Forest Service, Rachel and her team for all the work, the work that they do in conservation education. And a special thank you to all our affiliate co-hosts who are out there that are supporting this work at the regional, state and provincial level across North America. And a big thank you to E360 Plus and US EPA for supporting this webinar series as well. I know all of you know Zoom and how to use Zoom, but just in case you don't, everybody's on mute. Let us know if you have any issues through the chat. And just remember that you can use the closed captioning. You'll see the CC if you need help with the language. We do have people from all over the world, and we actually have 31 languages here to choose from if you need help with understanding. So if you need any help, just let us know. Just email us in the chat. And a big thank you to Carrie Albright, who is helping to support this webinar and all our webinar series. She is our social media and communications coordinator and is absolutely fabulous. So Carrie, thank you so much for all you do. And now the best part of the webinar is turning it over to our speakers. And I get to introduce our first speaker, Namal De Silva, who's gonna kick this off. She leads work on Together Birds at the American Bird Conservancy, or ABC, I love that acronym, advocating for the well-being of birds and people. She also teaches environmental justice at George Washington University, and she previously worked on globally threatened species and key biodiversity areas at Conservation International. Namal was born in Sri Lanka, grew up in Washington, DC, and cares deeply about community, wild beings, places, history, and cities. Namal also manages ABC's Conservation and Justice Fellowship, and two individuals from this year's cohort are going to be joining us in this conversation, and you'll get to meet them soon. So thank you so much for being here and orchestrating all of this, Namal, and thank you for all you do for education, for birds, and for justice. Let's give her a warm welcome. Thank you, Judy. I so appreciate that introduction. And I love your webinars. I'm a longtime fan. Um, so let's get started. Um, welcome. I wanted to um, just if you could go to the next slide. Um, I wanted to um, 
first, thank you all for being here. And to give you a, just a little bit of a welcome um, from ABC. ABC works, American Bird Conservancy works to protect birds throughout the Americas. And my work in particular, um, if we could go to the next slide. Um, oh, sorry, I, I need to backtrack for a moment and just go over the agenda for a second with you. Um, I'm gonna give a little bit of an introduction to um, the goals of this webinar. First, we want to, um, oh, Ooh. Sorry, I'll get back there. Don't worry. Don't okay. worry. <laughs> First, well, the, what we aim to do is we want to introduce birding and the idea that birds are for everyone. Learning about birds is for everyone and birds can be a window into so much more. Um, we want to introduce the idea of um, bir understanding birds in a way that connects us to each other and to places. And then um, we want to introduce you to our beautiful Together for Birds activity collection that was created for us um, by Project Learning Tree and Jacqueline Stallard will do that piece of it. Um, we'll hear from some of our conservation and justice fellows. Um, we will get a poetry reading from both Drew Lanham and Sydney Wade. Um, and then we'll get to hear some insights from Mike Parr and Kathy. Judy um, went over that already, but um, just to give you an overview of what's to come, we have a packed agenda. So I hope you'll keep telling us um, what you're interested in, the questions that you have in the chat. Um, so to get us started, one question. Who, um, if we could go to the next one. Um, who is a birder? Um, can What does a birder, when you think of a birder, who do you think of? Are you a birder? Um, do you know birders? Uh, put whatever thoughts come up for you in the chat. And what do you think birding is? Um, or what does birding mean to you? Any reflections welcome as we move forward. Next, please. So here's where I was going earlier. ABC has this initiative called Together for Birds. It's a it's an aspect of how we do the work that we do. And it has three components. The first is around, around belonging, balance, and fairness. And that really is thinking about institutions and partnerships and cultivating a culture of care and respect within ABC for our staff um, and in the relationships and partnerships that we have in the work that we do. The second piece of it is around ethical conservation. So what does the future of conservation look like? Um, I, I believe it to be ethical and just and inclusive. Um, what does that mean? It means centering partnerships, thinking about communities and what they need, um, and also storytelling, uh, talking about what, why we care about birds, about places, about the environment, um, and about social justice. So conservation and justice fellowships are an aspect of that work. Um, and then the final piece is what, why we're here today is birds for all. Um, thinking about inclusive birding and environmental education and the next generation, um, all that they will steward in the future. All right, next please. So to start, birds are everywhere. And that I think is the key reason they are a perfect window into the natural world and into understanding the places we inhabit, the places that are that that they call home and that we call home. Um, though they are everywhere, they're they're in urban areas, in rural areas, in suburban areas, in your schoolyards, outside of your apartment buildings. You can see birds through your window. Um, if you're in a wheelchair on an accessible trail, you can see them as well. Birds are everywhere, but we don't always take the time to slow down and notice them, to notice what they need, where they are how they bring us joy, how they spark wonder. Um, so to get us started, I'm gonna share a story with you and uh, bear with me while I read this because at heart, I'm a writer. Um, I'm gonna share, though we're here to talk about birds, I'm gonna share a story about rice. And the uh, idea of that is to help us think about some of the connections. Um, as educators, I think it helps to slow down. It helps to begin with some reflection about your own um, background, history, places, home places, um, the relationship that you have to the students that you're working with, to the places where you work, to the local community and its history, um, and to nearby habitats that support birds now or could support birds. So the deeper you dig into these interconnections, I believe the more wonder and richness you will find. So this is my story. 
humans domesticated rice, one species of rice, about 10,000 years ago, and another one in Africa around 3,000 years ago. Um, as Judy mentioned, I was born in Sri Lanka, which is a rice-focused land. Starting about 2,000 years ago, a series of Sri Lankan kings directed the people who worked for them to build a nested system of about 10,000 tanks, and these tanks distributed water to rivers and paddy fields. Many of those ancient tanks are now refuges for wetland birds. I left Sri Lanka when I was six, um, but it was, and I moved here to Washington, D.C., where I still live. And it was only about 10 years ago, not when I was in school um, in the D.C. public school system, but just about a decade ago, um, that I um, found out that there is this other species of rice that is a, wild, a type of wild rice that's native to um, native to the Anacostia River that's just about 10 minutes away from me. Um, so, oh, sorry, let me check if there's anything. Oh yes, Zizania aquatica, that's the species. And I, I was doing my doctoral research on environmental education in DC, and I learned about this Rice Rangers program. Rice Rangers has been run by the Anacostia Watershed Society for I think almost 20 years now. And it has kids um, planting this native wild rice in classrooms and then it's used for local um, river restoration efforts. And as the river is getting cleaner, as we have more um, wild rice, there's more ospreys and bald eagles and great blue herons um, that have found homes nearby. And, and this rice, it's um, sacred to the rice and the waterways themselves are sacred to the Piscataway people who used to harvest these this rice from canoes before Europeans arrived in that area. Um, this past week, I traveled to another rice focused place. I mentioned, um, or uh, one of our conservation and justice fellows, Claudia, um, worked in a national park in South Carolina. I did not get to see that park, but I did get to go to South Carolina's low country this week. Um, while there, I spoke with an Uber driver who commutes two hours one way from her small town to Charleston so that she can support her family. She also cooks on TikTok, and she said that she was shocked by how few people knew how to cook rice. I spent the weekend walking by $5 million houses on Sullivan Island and marveling at butterflies migrating along impressively intact and extensive coastal dunes. Yesterday morning, I accompanied E.J. Williams and other colleagues from ABC to Francis Marion National Forest. There, I met with inspiring biologists and forest service um, Forest Service staff who showed us around these gorgeous coastal wetlands and these longleaf pine forests. Um, from them, I learned that the Siwi people inhabited this area um, as long ago as 18,000 years, and that there are shell middens still um, that, that existed before they moved inland, um, which was itself before colonists and enslaved people arrived in the 1600s. Um, they told me how enslaved West Africans brought with them the skills to grow rice. And today, these biologists and park managers are using one specific West African technology called rice trunks to maintain optimal conditions for black rail and many other shorebirds. In the 1900s, so quite a bit later, um, then these rice technologies arrived, waterfowl hunters kept this area from being sold to developers. The collective stewardship of all of these people maintained this land as a refuge for roseate spoonbills, white pelicans, tricolored herons, ospreys, clapper rails, black rails, and so many other gorgeous birds. Um, going there yesterday, I don't think I've ever seen such an abundance of birds in one place. And to me, that illustrates that together we can do so much. Um, I'm going to, uh, that's the end of this rice story, but I wanted to ask you all um, if you could put in the chat what one surprising thing might be that you've learned about the history of where you work or live, about the birds that are local to you, about the history of place. Um, so as you do that in the chat, let's go to the next slide, which I should have got to before, but uh, honoring place. Um, so this is this is my main point. I believe that many of the answers lie in honoring people, the other beings with whom we share our planet, and the places where we live, work, and play. Next. 
And I want to transition us over to Drew, but in doing so, I want to introduce Drew in the way in which I encountered him. Um, I first uh, read Drew's work in the home place because I was I was studying sense of place and environmental education, and I was really struck by this quote, um, which I, I referred to in an NAAAE um, webinar in December of 2020 on reflective writing, which itself was inspired by a conversation um, at the NAAAE conference that Drew took part in. Um, but this is the quote. I think about land, but more and more, I also think about how, how other black and brown folks think about land. I wonder how our lives would change for the better if the ties to place weren't broken by bad memories, misinformation, and ignorance. I think about school children playing it safe, in safe, clean, green spaces where the water and air flow clear and the bird song sounds sweet. More and more, I think of land not just in the remote, desolate wilderness, but in inner city parks and suburban backyards and community gardens. I think of land and all it brings in my life. I think of land and hope that others are thinking about it too. Um, I love this statement and so much more in this memoir that Drew wrote. Um, but more recently, I've been reading more of his poetry. And later, um, a, a little bit after that webinar in 2021, I had the honor of having him as my teacher for a week at the Breadloaf Environmental Writers Conference, um, a, a week that was truly inspiring, both because of Drew's words, but also because of the other students in that workshop. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Drew to introduce himself further and maybe share a little poetry or words of wisdom. Um, Drew, over to you, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Namo, and good afternoon, good morning, um, good evening, maybe um, good night to some of you, wherever you are. Uh, it's such an honor to be here with you, wherever you are. Um, today, and I am so grateful to Namo and the amazing work that she is doing with the American Bird Conservancy, and to my uh, dear, dear friend Judy Browse with NAAAE. Um, these are two organizations that I support avidly, and when folks ask me um, about the organizations that I support, um, I tell them for birds, it's ABC. Um, and um, and NAAAE for just the the wonderful engagement um, that they that they do. So here today we're we're talking about birds and we're talking about engaging. And and Namal has told you rice stories, some from her homeland and um, her home place, and some from my home place. And um, I would I would like to share a little bit about. Um, birds in, in a way maybe that um, that hopefully begins to expand how we see nature. I frequently get um, questions about engaging. How do we get, well, here's the question. Someone will say, well, how do we get black and brown people to become birders? And um, I used to try to answer that question with um, with the data and and with an understanding of what birding is or isn't. Um, until I began to understand that I was really basing that response on ego. And um, the thing is that as Namal was telling stories of rice, um, there were enslaved people in my home place who were watching birds, who were thinking about nature, who were engaged in nature by force, but also by will of having to survive in it. So I would like for us to take our binoculars down for a moment and understand that engaging people is not about bringing them necessarily to where you are and into the defined spaces of nature that you have enclosed, but expanding it outward to think about how others might see birds. My grandmother's ornithology, I talk a lot about a lot, a, a good bit in my writing. She called a Northern Cardinal a red bird. A lot of people have called Northern Cardinals red birds, and they are truly red birds. She called yellow-billed cuckoos rain crows. She called great horned owls cat owls. Um, Bobwhite quail were partridges, and so on and so forth. Juncos, dark-eyed juncos, were snowbirds. Yellow flickers were yellowhammers. 
all of that was her ornithology. That's how I came to know birds, not by binomial nomenclature, not by lists, but by living daily with those birds and having some understanding of how to relate to birds in your space, not someone else's space, not by someone else's definition of it. So I think it's important um, that we follow that old adage of, of meeting folks where they are instead of bringing them where we want them to be, right? Um, there's, um, there's, a, there's a lot in that, I think. So I wanted to share um, a few pieces with you. I'm just returning from um, the middle part of the state and, and talking about birds and why I write about birds. Um, and you'll hear me say that I don't just write about birds as a conservationist, but as a poet and creative writer, I write um, for birds and I write to birds. And so I'll share um, a couple of pieces that I've written to, to that effect. But again, I want to remind us to, to, to take our binoculars down and as wide as the field of view might be in your ultra premium binoculars, I guarantee you, you will see much more with those binoculars down. To take into context the world in which birds live that we share with birds. Um, and so to think about the mantra of same air, same water, same soil, same earth, same fate. As we watch the canaries in the coal mine, the canaries watch us. All right, here's the first piece. And um, this is a piece that, um, that I call from my book, um, Sparrow Envy, Field Guide to Birds and Lesser Beast. This is field mark number three, and it's called Wood Thrush ID Made Simple. It's not so much about identifying what birds are as feeling who birds are. Head nods, jaw drops, smiles, tears, and abject adoration are all feel marks for identifying the wood thrush. A brown-backed forest singing soul seldom seen but more often heard and felt deeply. As this bird pumped its heart out in auto three-part harmony, the one inside my own chest stopped beating for a while. Considering birds. A heron waits at the water's edge wondering, wade or wait, fish or not. No multitudes to satisfy, no flock to feed, just one lone, long-legged, longing thing. Choose wisely, waiter. Wish and want won't will the hunger away. Had I wings to fly, how far would I wander? How high? It is task to earthbound souls like mine to worry over flight or falling. A sparrow sings the knowing. A feather's lift is faith enough. So thank you, Namal, for all the work that you do. Um, to to bring to make birds relevant. Birds are relevant in our lives. We just have to open our eyes beyond our binoculars um, to see it. And so I'm grateful to you. I'm grateful to Judy. I'm grateful to SFI for its support and to Project Learning Tree as well. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Drew. I so appreciate your words, your wisdom, and your art. I, I think that the integration between um, art and science, between ornithology and poetry, um, those are the ways in which we can spark the love of birds in a huge diversity of people. First, some people 
um, that listing, sorting, organizing, especially um, for uh, neurodiverse people, uh, people who um, are on the autism spectrum, listing is fantastic, categorizing and sorting. Um, for some of others of us, drawing birds or drawings of birds are our source of inspiration. And so I think that what Drew presented and what I hope to do with my work is basically create openings. Um, I'm going to try to shift us from those openings to the work on the ground. And with that, I'd love to shift us to um, our two conservation and justice fellows who are here. Um, these are two of our very first fellows at American Bird Conservancy, and they have inspired me over the past year and a half or so that um, I, we have been working together. Um, first up, I'd like to introduce Noah Gomes um, from Hawaii. Um, from Noah, I have learned so much about how stories deepen our relationships to place and how the, a range of stories helps us understand birds. Um, also, Noah and I talk about sense of place and stories embedded in place through the interactions um, that different communities have had over time. It's been such an inspiration. Noah, over to you. I would like to um, for you to introduce yourself in whatever way you like, but also to share a little bit about the storytelling work that you have done, the story gathering um, and language work that has been part of the way in which you've done environmental education. Sorry, of course I pushed the wrong button right when you, you cue me. Uh, <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, so I, yeah, uh, Noel Gomes, I um, am part Hawaiian, I have a lot of different ethnic backgrounds. Um, I'm from a little place in the middle of the island of Oahu in Hawaii, and I, I live in Hilo on what many people call the Big Island, on uh, the, the, the largest and most, so the most island on this, in this state. Um, gee, I don't know where to start. Uh, so the, my, my um, American Bird Conservancy Fellowship project, um, we, we've been calling the Pilina Project. Um, and I had the opportunity to go and speak with individuals from three, three different islands. Um, this island that I'm living on, Hawaii, uh, Maui, um, where the wildfires were recently, um, and Kauai, which is um, much further to the north. Um, and the reason why we chose those islands is because though on these particular islands, there are endangered species that are kind of teetering at the brink of, um, of extinction. Um, and, and in Hawaii, our, we have birds everywhere, as Namal was saying, we, but most of them are um, introduced species that people will see. The vast majority that people normally see in their day-to-day -day lives are introduced species. The native birds are either extinct or pushed so far into the forests or in, in marginal areas that humans don't interact, you know, mar marginal for humans, not for them necessarily, but places where humans don't go with, go and see them very often that a lot of us, our, our relationships with these, these birds are not the same as they were 200 years ago. Um, and so I guess we were, we were interested in seeing what are, what are the relationships that people have with our native forest birds now, today, um, this um, slide that Namal is showing that has pictures of the EEB, um, which is one of our most charismatic birds, um, and is, uh, as far as traditional culture is, is concerned, a very important one. Um, it's very famous in our poetry and our songs, um, and even some of our stories. Um, it's an important bird in traditional feather work because it's very beautiful. <laughs> Um, um, it, and there, there's, yeah, the stories with the EV are a little bit longer. There's a story that's mentioned here about, um, a couple of other birds, Ho'opapale, which is, um, extinct, and, um, Akohekohe, which is one of those critically endangered species that I mentioned a minute ago, um, specifically from Maui. Um, and the story that's mentioned right there on, uh, regarding the Po'opapale and the Akohekohe is a story about the origin of the relationship of those birds with one of our most important tree species and how that stretches to those birds and to many, many other forest bird species to this very day. Um, yeah, uh, so I, I, I 
there's so much many other things I could say. Um, I think that's uh, wonderful. Um, Noah, thank you so much. Um, I, I'm hoping that people will, because we have so many speakers and so little time, I'm hoping yeah. that people will ask more questions um, in the chat. And Noah, since you are um, on the move right now, we'll compile those and share them and, and maybe we can cover more in a reflection in the future. I so awesome. appreciate your work and I'm so excited to see what comes next. Um, I'm awesome. going to move on. Thank you so much, Noah Mahalo. Um, I'm going to move on to Claudia Santiago, who is our, another of our Conservation and Justice Fellows, um, whose work has spanned all sorts of things, from working in the National Park Service to working for the EPA. Um, she studied rhetoric. She has such a diversity of work experience, and I find that truly inspiring. Um, but I would like for Claudia to talk in particular about a little bit about her community engagement work. And Claudia, please introduce yourself uh, in any way that you like. Her fellowship project was on um, women's participation and leadership in the conservation of Alliance for Zero Extinction Sites. Claudia, over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm really happy to be here. So thank you for inviting me to speak this wonderful webinar. Um, so yeah, like I think my supervisor from grad school described me as a border person through and through, which I think is fits the fits me very well. I grew up in El Paso, Texas, which is a border um, area. So kind of uh, through my life, I've been struggling with uh, living in a border town where you have Mexico right next to us and then the United States, El Paso, Texas. Um, in terms of like my uh, heritage, I'm also kind of like a very diverse. Um, uh, my heritage is from Bahia, so um, I have indigenous uh, background, um, but I also have some Japanese heritage. And um, so all that mix of growing up in the United States and um, speaking Spanish, but also like having some Japanese culture embedded in that um, has been very interesting and, and like working through that through my life and understanding what that means and, and how to identify myself. It's been very interesting. Um, and also in terms of my work, like Namal mentioned, I started in physics. Um, and when I was a physics student at New Mexico State University, I worked in astrophysics, planetary science, and then in grad school, I did geophysics. And um, eventually I decided that communicating science was really important. So I got a master's degree in rhetoric and writing studies. Um, so after I graduated from grad school, I started as an intern in the National Park Service. And I started with interpretation, so uh, a lot of communication about science and about the parks. Um, and I was in the park service for five years. Um, and my last uh, job with the park service, which ended about five months ago, uh, was a biological science technician and citizen science coordinator. Um, and while I was in that role, uh, the National Park Service uh, had a fellowship for National Park Service staff. Uh, it was a partnership between the uh, American Geophysical Union and the National Park Service and Thriving Earth Exchange, which is a fellowship that's about community science. Um, so I had done a lot of uh, uh, public rhetoric, which involves a lot of uh, community engagement and understanding how to use rhetoric um, with communities to make them stronger, to solve problems, and that could be many different things. Um, but I think that fellowship really um, made me understand a lot about community engagement and community science, so how to engage with communities in the role as a scientist. Thank you, Claudia. And there's so much more to Claudia's work and Noah's work. We're sharing some articles and things in the chat right now, but we'll also send a follow-up e um, email with a lot of different resources. Claudia, thank you so much for sharing just that glimpse of your work. 
And now I'd like to move us on to digging into the product that we're here to celebrate, um, which is our Together for uh, Birds activity collection. And I know that Mike and Kathy have talked about the possibility of a bird focused um, project learning tree collection for a long time now. And it's such a pleasure to be at this point where it has come together and working with Jacqueline Stallard has been just a joy over the past year. It's um, we've had such a lot of wonderful conversations as we have pulled this together, as they've pulled this together with input from um, quite a lot of people at American Bird Conservancy. So without further ado, I'm going to transition us over to Jacqueline and please feel free to introduce yourself in, in the way that you'd like. Thanks so much, Namal. I'm delighted to be here this afternoon. Good morning, good night for some of you. Thanks you all for being here. Uh, my name is Jacqueline and I currently serve as a curriculum advisor for Project Learning Tree and the Sustainable Forestry Initiative. Next slide, please. I know some of you have heard about Project Learning Tree, but in case you haven't, I just wanted to quickly share our goal. We seek to advance environmental education, forest literacy, and career pathways using trees and forests as windows on the world. Next slide. We do this through a lifetime of learning. So beginning with our Project Learning Tree educational materials, which run from your littlest learners in pre-K as early as one years old, all the way up through seniors in high school, we use this middle piece here, this forest literacy framework. It's a hundred forest concepts to ground our knowledge in trees and forestry, thinking about when people move into adulthood and career pathways, what do we want them to know, learn, and understand about forests? And then this last piece on the right, thinking about career pathways, finding mentorship programs, finding field experience in green jobs and sustainable career pathways that they can move into into adulthood. So it all really begins with the education piece, which is my bread and butter. It's what I've come to love. It's my life's work for 20 years. So this is our lifetime of learning spectrum. Next slide, please. So this is me. Um, we're pretty good at making environmental education materials. We've been doing it since the first Earth Day back in the 1970s. And I'm not going to go through all these accolades, but this is this is my work. I work to create these resources. I work to modify these resources. I work to do professional development for these resources all across the United States and in some places internationally. But we don't do this alone. You can't just have this great resources with nobody to work with, right? So part of the way Project Learning Tree works is we have this tremendous network. We have local contacts, just like NAEE has affiliates. We have Project Learning Tree coordinators everywhere. So we'll share a link in the chat if you're not connected already, how to get joined up with a Project Learning Tree representative near you. Again, we're in every 50, all 50 states and some uh, locations internationally as well. So, so come check us out learn about doing professional development with us. We have them in person, hybrid, blended, anything, um, any way we can reach you, we would love for you to be engaged. So now that's a bit about PLT. I wanna talk about these activity collections. So we have all of these resources, which I showed on the last slide, that can be really overwhelming to somebody who's just getting started with environmental education, someone who's just interested in birds and wants to take a group of kids outside to learn something new. So what we started back in 2020 was making this um, resource available called an activity collection. So it's really just a bite-sized piece of curriculum. So each of these resources contains just three activities. So it's really user-friendly for non-formal educators as well. And they are focused on a certain topic and they are focused for a specific grade level. So the different colors you see here represent different grade level targets. So red is for grades K2, your green is for your grades three, five, and that blue color is for grades six, eight. So here we thought we have this amazing opportunity to collaborate with American Bird Conservancy to bring our curriculum expertise in environmental education with their expertise in their knowledge about birds to bring this to you, to educators, to families, to students and teachers who want to start outdoor explorations with birds. So I'm gonna dive right in to the next slide here and show you a little bit about what's inside. 
So this beautiful poster inside is inside. It talks about why we need birds and all of the ecosystem services that birds provide us that can be sparked with just seeing a bird outside your window. We're getting a little bit of combination between suburban and urban here. You can see that city in, in the distance because birds are found there too. But out here, we're enjoying a nice park scene. And all of these bubbles tell you about things that birds, you might notice birds doing and the things birds do for us in our ecosystems. So I mentioned um, this resource is really targeting grades K2, but each and every activity in this collection has adaptations for grades three, five as well. So you can really use it with all elementary audiences. It's very user-friendly and hands-on. You can use the activities one at a time, or they can be used in sequence, in succession. They're meant to build off each other. So you could use them from beginning to end if you wanted to use them as an entire unit. Here are the three activities within. Just a quick note on these. The first, uh, Trees as Habitats, really looks at that lens through trees and forests, which is so important to Project Learning Tree. But of course, birds are found everywhere. So we talk about other ecosystems as well and explorations into them. Activity two, birds and bugs, really hones in on specific adaptations birds have so that they can not only survive, but thrive in the place where they live and how they've come to do so. And the third activity, Neighborhood Naturalist, really gets you looking at that term naturalist, thinking about some of the green careers I talked about earlier. What does it take to be a naturalist? What do those investigations look like? And how can we support those all using birds that you can find right outside your doorstep? Know that you can go and download the activity collection today. We shared the link in the chat. Please go get it, share it, everything. We want you to use it due to our partnership with ABC. This resource is going to be available to everyone um, at least until the end of the year. So go grab it. It's there for you. Did want to tie together some parts of our webinar today. Drew is featured in our activity collection at the very end. Through our partnership with ABC, you've heard from the fellows about their work on the ground, but thinking about using the arts to teach science and using science to teach the arts, it's so beautiful. And poetry is a great way to do that. And that's a large part why we're here today. So Drew is featured with some of his writing uh, from Dawn Songs. This is a book, um, a project of American Bird Conservancy that we were so happy to learn about, partner with Drew on, include it in our activity collection for Together for Birds. So go check it out. And then the last connection I wanted to make is that Drew is also featured in another PLT resource as um, you see on screen here, we'll put the link in the chat. You can go grab that, download it today too. It's available as a free download. So this other PLT resources, you can see Black Faces and Green Spaces, the Journeys of Black Professionals and Care Green Careers. It profiles 22 individuals and their career pathway to get into a, a sustainable piece of work. And so go check out Drew's profile and some others and please feel free to share that resource widely. So that's my bit on PLT and Together for Birds. And I wanted to next introduce someone who is also featured in our activity collection. Sydney Wade is my friend. She is a fellow poet and a retired professor from the University of Florida, where she taught poetry, writing, and translation for 21 years. She currently splits her time between the states of Maine and Florida, and she now considers herself an avid birder for the past dozen years. So we're going to learn a little bit from Sydney how she got to discovering birds through poetry and writing, and she is featured with one of her poems in the Project Learning Tree Activity Collection as well. So be sure to check it out. Without further ado, Sydney, please take it away. Thank you so much, Jackie. This is um, an honor to be on a panel with so many wonderful activists um, on behalf of birds and nature. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Um, I have always been uh, uh, far more uh, inspired in my writing by landscapes and by ultimately birds uh, starting in 2010 uh, than any, anything else. Um, my own life story doesn't seem half as interesting as, as um, watching an absolutely gorgeous bird. And I know that there's going to be a, a little discussion on the spark birds uh, after this, but I wanted to share my own spark bird experience. I had gone out with the Alachua County Audubon group once or twice and I finally eventually got into my bins, a beautiful look at the Northern Parala. And can we have the next next uh, slide, please? I think there's a photograph of a, this beautiful bird. There she is, or he is. Um, 
I want, when I got that, when I saw that bird, I, I started screaming. I was just so excited um, saying, oh my God, it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. And that like a gateway drug was my gateway bird. Basically it brought me right into the world of birding. Um, and I was obsessed by it uh, ever since that moment of meeting that beautiful bird. And one of the things, uh, you know, birding is poetry. Um, and one of the things that if you live anywhere east of the Mississippi, these birds are in your backyard. You, it, most people don't see them because they don't come to bird feeders. They're insectivores and they live up high in the trees. But anybody can find them east of the Mississippi. So if, uh, if you're unaware of this, go out in your backyard with some good binoculars and look in the tops of the trees and you'll find them. Um, so uh, that's... Uh, as I said, I began birding in 2010, and I, I my whole life changed. Um, I started writing about nothing else than than birds, and it seems to me, um, for the purposes of this discussion, that there are many things, many similarities between uh, birding and poetry writing. Um, they rhyme, in, in a sense, in in several dimensions. One of them is that, as Namal had said, are everywhere. Uh, everyone can use and, and cultivate them. They're both free and open to all. They both demand a, a, a attention of a certain kind. Um, sometimes when I'm looking at a bird through the binoculars, there's a, and I get a good look at them, there's nothing in the world dead but, but this bird. And it's it's a wonderfully freeing It requires, and, and birding requires attention to the sounds that the birds are making as well. Writing poetry requires attention to the sounds that you've already put on the page. It's a very, very similar activity. Um, and we also, uh, both, both activities often require a great deal of luck, um, you know, in order to see the bird that you're interested in, in order to find the word that you need to, to help your poem out. Um, so I think what I'd like to do is um, go to the next page, the next slide, and uh, read a poem that was included in the Dawn Songs, um, also in my bird book. Uh, that's what I'll, I'll be reading from, but it's also in the other book. Um, it's uh, uh, I, I spend half my time in Rangeley, Maine, and half my time in Gainesville, Florida, where I taught for many years. Um, and in Rangeley, I live on Loon Lake, and so um, I am very familiar with the loons. And in fact, we we have fashioned a loon uh, nesting raft that has helped the loons enormously to to propagate in in challenging times. Um, this poem is called Loon, designed in cold, beautiful lines, brilliant-eyed black head, fire red eyes that defy the darkness in which it thrives. In pure lines, it dives for lively prey, lightning in black as it sweeps its waterways with sharp eyes. At home in deep cold water, at home in the dome of the sky, at home in flight as it roams from summer to winter, its unearthly cries haunt our sleep. They bring splinters of wildness to our nights as we navigate through dreams and the streaming wakes of the trails we earthlings make. So just a note on the um, on the form of this poem. I This is the one that I've, I've ended up with. I've, I've written in many forms, but I love this long skinny line because what it is, is it forces me to pay every single word. Um, you'll see that there are some lines have one line, have one word on them. Um, I can hear the spaces between the, the little couplets make it easier to hear the similarities in the sounds. I think you'll notice that there's a lot of um, off rhyme, there's a lot of perfect rhyme, there's a lot of um, assonance and, and uh, um, alliteration, which are um, the tools of the trade, basically. Um, and I, one of the reasons I appreciate this form is that it opens things up and allows me to pay much more attention to the sounds 
Um, I myself am a, a, a my eyes are terrible. And so uh, my ears are very good. And so I, I, I go bird listening more often than I go uh, bird watching. Um, but the same kind of attention is required, I think, when thinking about poetry and when looking for birds. Um, I think that was probably, is there another, is there another a slide for me or no, am I finished? This is it. Thank you okay. so much. Okay, I think I think I'm done then. That Thanks was so much. beautiful and inspiring. And I just saw that um one of my colleagues from ABC who uh, works with loons was really engaged by that poem. So thank you for that reading and for the explanation around it. Um yeah. with that, I'm gonna keep us on that theme of spark birds that Sydney um got us thinking about because uh, it really, at the end of the day, education is about engaging curiosity and engaging a sense of, um, ideally, curiosity about the world around us, curiosity about ourselves, um, curiosity about history and place. And that curiosity starts from a single spark, um, whatever that catch is that gets us excited, whether it's a poem or a bird, um, the beauty and wonder of a bird. And so Mike, I would love to invite you to, um, to share just a, a little story about one of your spark birds. Sure, thanks Normal. Um, it's great to be part of this and I've really enjoyed all of the poems and feedback. Um, I grew up in England and <clears throat> if the British are known for a couple of things, it's fish and chips and birding. Um, so, I did eat fish and chips from time to time, but I also got into birding. And um, the spark, my spark bird was really um, the great spotted woodpecker. And when I was young, my mom bought me these little peanut feeders and we put them in the backyard. And often the house sparrows would come to them and uh, they'd kind of hog the scene. But then once in a while, this large, spectacular black, white and red bird would show up. And I was really taken with it and learned what it was. And it, it came from the woods nearby and it would come once in a while. And so sort of the rarity of this experience also struck me as something that was special that I would wait for. And so that was uh, that was what started me off was the great spotted woodpecker. And um, for those of you who, are, who know North American birds, it's very similar in size and, and color to the hairy woodpecker of North America. So that was that was it. That's what got me going. Thanks so much, Mike. And um, for it's listed on the slide as well. But for those who don't know, Mike is the president of American Bird Conservancy. And um, he and I have been working together for a few years on Together for Birds. I've known him for a little bit longer through his work um, as head of the Alliance for Zero Extinction, which is a multi institutional partnership that's working to protect the most threatened species. Um, Kathy, the president and CEO of Sustainable Forestry Initiative. Welcome to you. Um, Mike, thank you for that. Um, could I ask you the same question? Could yes. Could you share a little story about a bird that inspires you in some way? Absolutely. And, and again, thank you everyone for um, this great webinar and NAAE for, for hosting it and bringing communities together. It's just such a pleasure to be here with um, many of our close partners and with all of these uh, individuals that care about birds. I also just want to acknowledge that I'm calling in from the unceded traditional territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people in uh, what is known as uh, present day Ottawa, Canada. I mentioned in the chat, I'm bringing the North into the North American Association for Environmental Education here. Um, a bird story and a bird that is close to my heart, I just want to say the actual fact is um, my daughter, is, whose nickname is Bird, is the bird that is closest to my heart. And I will move on to the spark bird quickly, but she got her nickname Bird um, because of uh, when she was young, when she was hungry, she would throw her head back and open her mouth or she had a real knack for running into glass doors and knocking herself out, knocking herself out. Um, and over the years, uh, because of her spark bird, which um, was uh, definitely red cardinals that nested on her porch in Ottawa, um, she became a bird lover and uh, ended up working uh, around uh, Vancouver Island 
uh, finding northern goshawk nests and uh, ensuring that harvesting operations didn't go on in those territories. But, you know, what what gave Nina um, this love of birds was the opportunity to see birds and access birds and have accessibility to birds from a very young age. And I think that's what we're all trying to ensure here that everyone, young or old, um, has access to these lovely, you know, amazing creatures that um, are so essential to our ecological systems, but to our health, to our well-being, to just being very calm on this webinar compared to most webinars you're on, just even the hearing about birds and, and poetry on birds is so inspiring. But um, we've had the luxury of birds um, being, you know, we we're talking about place and the importance of place, but just at the, the lake, you know, we get to see common loons at nighttime and hear their sounds. And one of our favorite things to do is go to sleep on the screen and porch so we can hear those loons at night. Um, but we also have bald eagles and ruby throated hummingbirds and purple finches, downy woodpeckers and all of this glory right around us. And part of what um, really excites me about um, this opportunity and this collaboration is um, what um, what Drew mentioned as well is um, how he thinks about land and what those spaces are. And also just thinking about any green space that is around us and ensuring that um, we're doing our shared duty to provide those green spaces um, for a better quality of life, to also provide those spaces for birds and so that birds, people, trees, green spaces can all connect. Um, so again, thank you um, for, for this uh, lovely session. It's been fantastic. Thank you so much. Kathy, that was a beautiful story. And I just think about a baby bird and your <laughs> baby. <laughs> um, so let's let's wrap up with uh, just one more question for each of you. Mike, um, what does the, the, the title of this webinar mean to you, Birds for All? Um, could you just briefly give us a, an impression of that, what that is for you? And then Kathy, if you could do the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'd love to. And I, I noticed from the chat that there are a lot of people who are already at least somewhat into birding and bird watching. And so all of you already kind of know the secret of birds. But I I think that birds are kind of like music. They might be like poetry, but to me, they're kind of like music. It, it's almost it requires a little bit of digging to get to the point where you can begin to appreciate it. And this, these days, it's so much of what entertains and absorbs people is passive through technology. And I always feel like there's so much more to be gained from the things that we have to work on a little bit to engage in and gather some knowledge that we can then begin to be more satisfied with the way we're connecting to it in a way. And birds provide a bridge to reconnect to nature in a way that I, I think few things do. Um, if you haven't gotten into birds, um, I think I think like Sydney said, you know, the, the northern parallel might be up at the, the treetops and it's not the easiest thing always to get to know those birds, but start somewhere. And we're encouraging people everybody to learn at least five birds in your immediate surroundings as a starting point for all of us to reconnect to nature. They're a bridge to learn something about what they do, where they go, and start with five. Um, I started with that one woodpecker and it led me to a lifetime of enjoyment. It's like another dimension to my everyday life that I noticed birds around me. It, it's as though if it, if birds were taken away, it would be like a, a world without music. But it does take a little bit of effort to actually connect and learn a little bit about them. Um, so it's, I think it's a good discipline for all of us to try and make that effort to make that bridge back to nature because it's not going to happen without us doing something. And birds are there; they're ready for us. They're saying, you know, they're singing to us, saying, "Come on." listen to what I'm saying, you can you can learn about me and you can actually connect. And it just opens up a huge new window on your life 
the you know birding isn't something you just go out and do and then you go back home and stop it's something you can do all the time and yesterday i was driving around uh the dc area and every evening a huge group of fish crows flies across dc thousands of them most people don't even see them um but you just look up and you watch these groups of fish crows in the evening i found where they go to roost over in clarendon virginia i've been wondering where they go to roost and i discovered their roosting area i was so excited to see this um and just watching these fish crows just looking up and it was just a, an extra little bit of joy for my day um so you know that's the thing together for birds and birds for all is like it just brings another dimension of joy and connection back to nature for all of us and i would recommend making that little bit of effort start by learning five and go from there so there you have it thank you all uh it's been a great great fun webinar thanks so much mike and i, th I think in a time when disconnection and and overwhelm our problems that many of us experience there just seems to be so much going on I, I think that slowing down and noticing that you were talking about it, it is an amazing remedy for all of that Kathy could what about you you already kind of started answering this question I think but I did anything more to add on birds for all and what that means for you yeah so um birds for all or all for birds um, as well. Um, and uh, the Project Learning Tree ABC guide is together for birds. I think it's important for all of us to think about um, not just those accessibility statements and bringing birds to everyone, but also what can we do in our lives, in our spheres of influences to maintain, recover and restore birds and also bring people um, to these experiences, um, these wonderful experiences that connect with them birds. And, you know, just some uh, small examples, how, for example, ABC and SFI have been working on that beyond the education tools um, has, well, there've been education tools in a different way. The project learning tree guide is a set, you know, is are for anyone to sort of bring awareness of birds, um, to as broad of population as possible, but other tools that we've been working on SFI has 360 million acres of land that's certified to our standard from Canada's boreal to the U S South. And for over a decade, ABC and SFI have been partnering to improve bird conservation um, in different forests and bring landowners together and help them understand the on the ground habitats that are needed, um, whether it's snake creation or deployment of nesting boxes or specific habitat requirements. And we are seeing uh, whether we can claim it's as a result of our work, but we know that in the areas that we are working and collaborating, we are contributing to reverse declines in Lewis's woodpecker, the white-headed um, woodpecker, the flammulated owl, and Williams and sapsucker. Um, and these are all U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service species of concern. And likewise, we're working in other geographies and um, seeing uh, better numbers of prairie warblers and Mississippi kites, where we work with landowners to provide those habitats. And so when working with educators, we want to be able to collaborate. It was really Mike's idea, and he approached us at um, Project Learning Tree, which is an initiative, the Sustainable Forestry Initiative. I think everyone knows that, but um, about doing this guide um, for for um, making uh you know, birds accessible to all. And and really he spoke to me about the story he just shared with you about if we can spark an interest and get people to know five birds, that's a tipping point to their curiosity and their care um, for, for birds. And so it's just a, a little anecdote to say, um, I think we do have to think about how we can make a difference, whether it's in our personal lives of putting up a, um, you know, a, bird box or duck box or what, what whatever, um, or really um, bringing others outside in nature, or if we have an ability to influence outcomes on a larger scale to try to think about how we can be together um, for birds. And that's the name of Project Learning Tree and ABC's guide together for birds. Uh, that's what we're trying to be. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Kathy. And I think uh, your story highlighted the value of partnerships, how we can only do all that we need to do for birds and for people if we work together across organizations, across community boundaries, across all the sorts of divisions that um, are inherent in our societies. And, and I think partnerships is a, a key Partner, I know that partnerships are central to how ABC does our work. Um, and they're central to how work happens in communities and in schools. I think what you were talking about, Kathy, really leads me to think about schoolyards. That act of noticing the bird, we notice where that bird is, where that bird might thrive. That might involve greening the schoolyard a little bit or, or putting some bird tape on the windows to minimize collisions. Um, there's so much we can do, and a lot of it it is small scale, and it really does add up. Um, so I, I love that reminder at the end. Um, and if I could just add, I, and I just put it in the chat, uh, I spoke about the partnership with American Bird Conservancy. I want to also say we've had such a wonderful longstanding partnership with NAAE in environmental education and are really focused on how do we make environmental education tools more accessible um, to, to more people. And, you know, we couldn't do what we do. Um, in the education space without the leadership of NAAE, and we're so thankful for that. So just want to thank you again for sharing this platform um, and our and our partnership. So th thanks. Um, thank you. Thanks so much, Kathy. Um, and before I turn it over to Judy, I wanted to mention that NAAE is a huge part of how I ended up doing the work that I do now through one of the local chapters, the DC Environmental Education Consortium, um, which was the focus of my doctoral research. And so it, it's so nice to tie all of these threads together. Um, I'm gonna turn it back to Judy with thanks to Kathy, Mike, Sydney, Drew, um, Noah, Claudia, and Jacqueline, um, and, and everyone who's working behind the scenes as well. Judy, over to you. Could you also share a little bit about a spark bird or what birds for all means to you in wrapping us up? Thank you so much. And just a giant thank you to all of you. What a wonderful webinar. Oh my gosh, I love the talking, not only about birds, but creative writing and inclusivity and our relationship to nature. I have uh, so many birds that have sparked me, but I will say the indigo bunting, like Devin, I think, also had the indigo bunting. So I was a kid and we would go hiking every Sunday with the park naturalist before I could even walk. So I could identify pretty much anything by the time I was 10. And when I got out to DC, I found my indigo buntings. I know where to find them on the bike trail. And when I see them, it just makes my day. They are gorgeous. But there are so many wonderful birds. And I loved hearing your spark birds. So Thank you all so much for that wonderful webinar. We're so honored to host this. We love working with ABC, with PLT, don't you love the acronyms, and with SFI. But thank you all so much. Um, and here is the feedback. Um, if you just want to put your camera on that to share your feedback about the webinar, and we always want to hear from you about how we're doing, what other topics make sense, what other speakers, we're always looking for more insight from all of you. Thank you so much for being here. And we will stay here for a few minutes. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, um, Carrie, who has a few closing words, but just a big thank you to all of you. And then if anybody has questions, we'll turn, we'll stop sharing and see if any questions come in for a few minutes. How's that? So Carrie, take it away. That sounds great. And again, thank you all for contributing such thoughtful and unique and inspiring input in today's conversation. So much wonderful content to reflect on and to really put into practice. So thank you all for sharing with us. Um, I know we had a lot of different materials and links coming through the chat today and also in the slide deck. So I want to reassure everyone that you will get the webinar recording, you'll get the slides, the notes, the links. They're all going to come straight to your email addresses. So look out for those. Um, and as you saw, we also have an, a webinar evaluation link that we'd love to have some feedback on. So we'll make sure that that's in the chat for you to find. And we always close out our webinars with a few announcements. And today, I know we had so many different things that we shared about and exchanged. So I'll just touch on just one quick reminder for those of you who are able to join us 
at our conference, NAAAA's annual conference last week. Um, the sessions, the keynote recordings are all going to be available through March of 2024. But if you weren't able to make it and you're missing out, there are over 350 recordings of the sessions that took place. So you can still get in and register to be able to see this content about outdoor education, e-STEM, climate change education policy, civic engagement, all these different topics. If you go to conference.naaw.org, um, that'll allow you to register and you can start digging into more captivating content like what we've heard today. Uh, there's plenty to explore there. So we have a few minutes to consider some of the questions that you've shared in the chat. Again, if you have questions, please do make sure to share them. We'll try and uh, work through those. And for the panelists who we have remaining with us today, again, thank you so much for joining us. But one question that we had come through is, a little bit about sort of the bigger impact that we're having on birds and how we think about that and, and potentially what we can consider for uh, their ability to thrive as well. The question is, it says, I think of our bird relatives and how they too are impacted with human borders and war and what impact will these human destructive uh, impacts have on the birds as well. So for those of you who've been sharing about your experiences with birding, whether it's through observation and research or just pure enjoyment of them, what are your thoughts on how to consider how we um, take care of all of our different species, knowing that birds are so precious and in such a, an important part of our ecosystem? Any thoughts from any of our panelists? Um, I could certainly try and take that if you'd like. Um, primarily birds need habitat. And so the most important single thing is to conserve and manage habitat sufficient to support bird populations uh, so that they can thrive and uh, hopefully recover their numbers because we're actually seeing a decline in North American bird populations and similarly in Europe. Um, a lot of times we individually aren't really in a great position to change massive habitat areas through creating national parks and things like that. So I always think that the, the starting place is in your own environment. And very often that means in your own backyard or around your house, what can you do to help birds specifically where you live? Um, joining a conservation group like ABC is a good way to help birds in the broader world, but you can do things like um, protect birds from colliding with your windows. And birds often, unfortunately, see reflections in glass and collide with glass. You can actually, if you go to ABC's website at abcbirds.org, you'll find information there about how to treat your windows in ways that birds can find them more visible. If you have a cat, don't allow it outside because cats do kill uh, birds and they sometimes eat them or they sometimes just uh, unfortunately maim them and birds can't recover from that. Um, and, you know, we have some supporters who have much larger yards or of, of hundreds of acres or thousands of acres. But even if you have just uh, a small yard, you can grow some native species which are often much better for birds um don't use pesticides around the house because those can actually kill the insects that a lot of birds feed on and you can put up some bird feeders and possibly some bird boxes we have house wrens nesting at our house we have uh, a lot of bird boxes at the house which house wrens use so there are some things you can immediately do to help birds in your immediate vicinity and then working to you know together as a voice for birds through groups like ABC, we do a lot to help habitat, working with groups like the Sustainable Forestry Initiative to protect forests all over North America um, and to protect wetlands and habitat outside of North America where a lot of our birds go for the winter. So I think my answer would be, for, um, would be do what you can around your home and then work together with us and other, other groups that support birds Join those groups and lend your voice. And if you become a member, lend your financial support to the effort to protect habitat much more broadly. And if you do those things, I think you're making a really positive contribution. Uh, thank you, Mike. I feel like you encompass the entire sphere of uh, the opportunity to do things on a large scale and also the opportunity to do things with maybe a young learner who's just figuring out how they can have a positive impact. So that was a fantastic response and the perfect way to summarize our, our conversation from today of really thinking about it spherically and considering what we're able to do. So, thank so you. I wanted to say thank you again to everybody who joined us, to Drew, Sydney, Noah, Claudia, uh, Kathy, Mike, and obviously our partners at Project Learning Tree and the American Bird Conservancy. It has been
been a wonderful gathering of educators and those dedicated to the natural world. So we're so glad that you all joined us. Thanks, Carrie and Namal. Namal, I always I, I have to keep correcting myself. I apologize. Do you want to close Thank us you, out with a few final words? Um, I think you wrapped us up wonderfully there. Um, we'll gather together the questions in the chat um, and, and we'll provide some feedback when we send out that final email that Carrie mentioned. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank Take you. Care. Take care. Bye-bye.